Um, for uh, for today's lecture, I want to talk about I want to talk about scansion. Last week we talked about operative stress versus relative stress, and what I think some of the confusions between the two are. And we talked a lot about operative stress as your operative words, generally one or two a line, um, often the last word of the line, but not always. And they form your map. They're your sort of creative map that you're that you're painting throughout a speech or a piece or even just a pair of three lines um, to carry the story in an interesting way. So, so much of our battle is to maintain our audience's ear. Um, part of last week's discussion example was the fact that often with bad Shakespeare or boring Shakespeare or Shakespeare that you zone out on, it's not about somebody being terrible. That is something different. It's, it's more about the fact that it all sounds the same, that uh, stress is sort of relative or even across most of the speech, um, that you're hearing the same kind of emphasis over and over again, which is often weighed at somebody hammering on words every time they want you to hear them, which after a certain point, you're gonna zone out, you're gonna lose it. Um, and I think we've all had the experience of listening to a very well-spoken person up on stage and sort of wondering why we zone out and sort of lose track of it. Um, so on the other side of operative stress was relative stress. I touched on it briefly. It's just the idea, it's the basic idea of scansion, the iambic, da-dum, 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 da-dum. The second half of the foot has more stress than the first. Um, and I got some questions about that. And I, um, and I, I, I wanted, I thought it might be a good time to go over it. Um, and I'm gonna do it lightly. I really do think that scansion intimidates people. They look at it as an intellectual exercise. Um, which it's not, or it shouldn't be. Um, and as I said last week, you know, I, I, I work with young actors sometimes who have annotated their whole script and it just doesn't seem to help them because I don't think they know what it's supposed to do. Um, and I do think so many of Shakespeare's keys, clues, hints, notes are laced into this verse which he didn't invent, but had been invented very recently. I mean, he was, he was created, he was, his act of creation within the construction of blank verse uh, was absolutely, I mean, he has, he's the biggest influencer. Ar arguably Marlowe actually created it, um, but uh, although that is debatable, but Shakespeare certainly wasn't the first. However, uh, it is, he created the form we now know and he did so much in it that I think we've sort of, many of us have lost. And so I wanna spend, I mean, I think a lot of these lectures are going to be about what you can extract from the verse, what you can, um, the notes you can hear from, from uh, the old man in the ground. Um, and uh, so I think a lot of the lectures will be about things like that. Um, again, I can recommend uh, John Barton's Playing Shakespeare. He does a wonderful job going over this. Most of it's free online on YouTube. It's from the 80s, so it's a little aged, but uh, brilliant actors, very engaging. Um, and he goes over a lot of these things. He doesn't do as specific verse work as we're doing. I think this medium sort of lends itself to, to this, but, um, but he touches on a lot of them. So I thought if I was gonna spend time digging out the verse, we should at least spend a lecture on the basics of scansion. And my, my goal in talking to you about it is hopefully to demystify it a little um, and to hopefully take away some of the intimidation. I don't want to use a lot of the sort of big terms, although I'm going to give you a few of them so that you can walk away with a glossary if that's helpful to you. Um, I know for some people here, this is going to be old hat. And I mean, a review is never a bad thing. Um, so hopefully, I mean, again, my hope is, is to look at it in an interesting way. So um, I hope that even for those that really know this stuff, and I'm sure plenty of you do, uh, this won't be um, too dull. Um, so what I titled this was Seeking the Irregular. And what I mean by that is, at least on the most basic scale, running over a text, what you're really looking for is what isn't even, what isn't regular verse. Um, spending your time marking through the very even iambic pentameter, I don't think helps you. Now, of course, you need to spend a lot of time with that text. As per last week with our operative words, it's interpretive. You have multiple options, right? So I'm not saying that even lines shouldn't be looked at. They most certainly should. Um, but when you do an initial scan, an initial run over it, it's really the irregular that you're looking for. And um, 
And I think that that becomes exciting. And that's, that's where you sort of get into the interesting work of Scansion. The even stuff, uh, at least at the most basic level, is relatively boring. And if you spend hours marking through it, it's going to be intellectual. And you're going to lose sight of why you're even doing it. In fact, I think through, in a lot of cases, people really don't know. They think they should. Um, and, you know, they're either good students and they may be great actors, but still they're practicing a process I, I don't know that they entirely understand. Um, so um, that's what I want to look at. I'm going to go over very briefly some classical notation. This is the most basic, and I don't want this to bore anybody. I'm just going to start with the most basic. So in a basic classical notation of iambic pentameter, um, again, da-da, 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 da-da. You can, the classical notation is to mark your unstressed syllables. Well, there's two ways. One is with a macron, which is a flat line. That's M-A-C-R-O-N. Um, and then to mark the accented words with a breve, that's a little like, here, I, this is, I'm technically deficient, so I literally wrote it out and I'm gonna show it to you. Um, is this mirrored? Can you see this? Can you read it? You can read it, there you go, excellent. So the top line, that's macrons and breves, all right? Those are the flat lines and the little circles, okay? The bottom line is a more advanced, not advanced, more recent classical notation, that's X's, and I actually, I don't know if they have a special or fantastic word for those. They're just X's to me. Those are your unstressed syllables. And you have ictuses, that's I-C-T-U-S. Those are your little dashes for your accented words, okay? So that is the most basic classical notation. Now this is to be or not to be, so it's actually a feminine ending. So I usually will mark my feminines with a little 11 at the end, just so as I look over the script, I can see if there's big chunks where multiple feminine endings are happening at once. Um, and we'll talk a little bit, little bit about feminine endings um, tonight. Uh, on their most basic scale, a feminine ending is literally just a line that ends on an unstressed syllable. In Shakespeare parlance, we tend to refer to all 11 beat lines as feminines. I do too. So that's generally what you hear. The actual definition is just that the final the final accent of the line is unstressed. And if the final accent of the line is stressed, that's a masculine ending line. This is all based on French. I don't know why, poetically, we've, we've taken the French, but um, in most French words that end, it's a masculine, it, you know, it's a, it's a gendered language. So in most words that end with a stress, it's a masculine word. Most that end without a stress, it's a feminine word. Um, so that's your basic classical notation. And you'll see people scan up the whole script that way, um, an I am, that's I-A-M-B. This is where we get iambic pentameter. Pentameter is five feet or 10 beats to a line. It's an unstressed followed by a stress, da-da. The opposite of that is a trochee, T-R-O-C-H-E-E. -E. And that is just the opposite. You start with the accent and you go off. Um, there are a ton of words for this stuff. Um, you know, and uh, some of you may take pleasure in uh, gaining a vocabulary in Pyrrhics and Spondies and Anapests, and uh, I, I like it. You can geek out over it, it can be fun, but it's, it is an, I, I do think it's a barrier to actually practically working on it. Um, well, it doesn't have to be a barrier. I think a lot of students face it as a barrier. So I'm not gonna go into it. There's, a, there's many free resources online. I encourage you to go down the rabbit hole um, I'm also speaking of the feet as two beats. These are disyllabic feet, da-da or da-dum. Um, there are trisyllabic feet and you can get into it. Um, enjoy it if you want to. I don't think it's helpful for our practical purposes today. Um, so that's a beginning glossary. We'll go over a few more terms as we go. Um, but I want to, I want to work on, I want to look at text. Um, and show you how I go through it, um, which is generally very fast. And when, I, and when I say I go through it, this is not the end all. This is just a first run on something um, to give me a foundation. Um, and, you know, I think it's interesting. Music is the right metaphor for this, okay? Um, jazz and hip hop are very good close ones because we're talking about rhythmic form. We're talking about stress on a line, under a line, between a line. 
And they're the forms in which you can most actively hear how artists are shaping phrasings, okay? Um, uh, it's what made Frank Sinatra a genius. You know, he had a, he had a beautiful voice, but many, many people have. Uh, it's how he phrased his songs, and it's in the phrasing that the storytelling happens. And so what we're going over tonight is the most basic foundational map. This is the beginning. This is not the end. This is just the beginning of the phrasing, and this is what Scansion can help you with. So um, I'm going to throw a link up in the chat. This is to our free Shakespeare. Um, let me see. And this is to, there you go. You're going to scroll down to about, let's see. I'm going to scroll down to ju ju just a little ways down. We're starting with tis torture and not mercy. So Romeo's speech beginning tis torture and not mercy. So what I want to look at tonight is we're going to look at Romeo and we're going to look at Leontes in The Winter's Tale. And the reason we're looking at these two um, is that they're, they're wildly opposite speeches. Romeo is, Romeo is almost entirely regular. I think there's one feminine ending and there's two arguable 12 beat lines that's interpretive and we'll get to it because I think it's interesting. Um, Leontes is almost entirely irregular. It's totally fucked. Um, and the two of them are wonderful contrasts of versification and what Shakespeare does with it. Um, but what's interesting is they're both highly emotionally charged speeches. Some people will talk to you about uh, meter going off as an, an emotional clue. And I, I, that has not borne out in my experience. Um, Romeo's at the height of emotion here and Leontes is as well over different things. Um, although both over a woman, as it turns out, um, but uh, in very different ways. Um, so Romeo's, uh, you're, what you're going to hear, I'm going to do this like a metronome, okay? So this is, obviously, this isn't going to be a great performance, but I, I hope it'll show some of the things I'm talking about. But Romeo's speech is like a hammer, right? And Leonti's speech writhes through it, right? So they operate differently, and you're going to hear it even in this sort of metronomical rendition. So, um, tis torture and not mercy. Are we all there? I hope we're all there. All right. Um, so literally as if a metronome's going through, and what I'm going to do is I am aiming, if something is even, I'm rolling right past it. I'm not doing any extra work on it right now. That works for later. I'm just establishing it, that it's an even line and I can move on. The minute something hiccups, I stop, right? So right away, right away we're gonna have a hiccup, which is tis torture and not mercy, heaven is here. So heaven gives us the hiccup and heaven, in this case, and often in Shakespeare, is an elision. So it was probably pronounced hen, right? So we don't want to pronounce it that way today because it'll make our audience's ear jump out. But it, heaven scans to one syllable in most of Shakespeare. But again, to his, he's making this up as he goes too. Later in this speech, we're going to have heaven said with two syllables. So you're going to be finding the fact that he's improvising too. And once you, get a, once you get a feeling for the rhythm of this, it's really exciting. So heaven usually elides to one syllable. Some other examples are power, almost always elides to one syllable. Spirit, so power would be poor, which is, again, strange. Spirit almost always elides to one syllable, spirit. Um, and again, if you put this in your ear in sort of an Irish brogue or something, as it runs over, these words would be less awkward to hear in this way. But in, in our sort of slightly more consonant-focused, structured modern English, they pop out. Um, now, so do you do anything with that? That's entirely your call. Um, it can go, tis torture and not mercy, heaven is here. And you just give it two syllables, but you pack them in. Or you play it as heaven, right? And so you know it's one syllable, right? Tis torture and not mercy, heaven is here where Juliet lives, right? Hiccup. Juliet elides to two syllables, as it often does in the script, but again, not always, right? So this is, you're just building a foundation. You're getting a sense of the rhythm of the speech. Um, now, on your, if you want to, I don't even know if this is how, um, I, I'm not, I don't need to, I use the sort of macron line over the syllable I might drop to remind me to take it out. So I just draw a little line over that. It's almost always a vowel sound. In fact, it may always be a vowel sound that you're dropping out of a word. Um, so I just put a little line to mark it for myself. 
So in this sense, Juliet scans to two syllables. Where Juliet lives in every cat and dog and little mouse, every unworthy thing live here in heaven. Two syllables now, right? So you've done it once as one and now it's twice. Live here in heaven and may look on her, but Romeo may not more validity. So we have this hiccup, right? Um, and this is interesting because you could go, you could elide Romeo to two syllables and make it, but Romeo may not more validity, right? And that's an even line, but it's not right. You can hear that it's not right. Um, and so this is where you have to start getting creative. So what is, what is the difference? Now, accent can follow accent, unstressed can follow unstressed. And again, there are terms for all these things if you wanna get excited about them. Um, but uh, the basic work of laying the foundation of what Shakespeare has offered you is to figure out at least a, a sort of basic form of it. So what I would suggest in this would actually be that this line, there are twice that he, Romeo says, but Romeo may not. and I would suggest that both are actually 12 beat lines, right? Which are officially Alexandrian lines. Um, and what that would demand would be putting a caesura, and here's another glossary term, C-A-E-S-U-R, caesura, uh, into the verse. And a caesura is just a pause, right? So it's a, it's a space of silence that takes up part of a verse line. Now, in some poetic structure, caesuras are defined as pauses that happen outside of the verse structure. So not to be confused with some other poetic terms. Often in practice, when you're working on Shakespeare, if somebody says sujura, it's within the line. In which case it would go, but Romeo may not beat more validity. Okay, so it creates a 12. So you have a little pause, but Romeo may not, which is sort of his central point. Everything in the speech is building up to everything everything else can do that he cannot. It is his great wound. It is his great passion right? He is overwhelmed with grief. And Romeo's verse hammers. It hammers it home with the exception of these two lines. And I think one feminine near the end, everything is even, right? And it's wonderfully interesting when you start hooking in to that meter. And Romeo, upset as he is, knows exactly what he wants. He's deeply impassioned about exactly what he wants. So even though he's upset, his thoughts are in perfect order, okay? So his verse is in almost perfect order. And we arguably have two lines of 12 syllables, if there's a little beat in there, where he expands the verse. He demands an extra two pieces of verse to make his central point. Um, and this is, this is the stuff that I love, right? This is the stuff that I can get excited about. Um, I, it may be a little intellectual right now, but again, this is just, so, but Romeo may not beat more validity. And then we just keep going, more honorable state, more courtship lives in carrion plot. Now, well, okay, so I just alighted carrion to two syllables. If you read it and carrion flies, then Rome, you know, immediately, you know, you're off, right? So carrion elides to two, carrion, that I essentially becomes a Y. In carrion flies, then Romeo, they may see. So Romeo there does, does allied to two syllables. So you can see, as we create this structure, Shakespeare is not helping us by giving us set rules. Um, what he's opening to us is the fact that not only can things change, but this is interpretive. You can make a different argument about it. I've seen people restructure lines in strange and interesting ways, and it may not seem obvious, but it is interpretive. You know, this is part of the, this is part of the enjoyment of the work. Um, in Carrion Flies, then Romeo, they may seize on the white wonder of dear Juliet's hand. So Juliet elides to two, and steal a mortal blessing from her lips, who e'en in, who e'en in pure and vestal modesty. So even, elides to one syllable, spell it E-E-N, it's the most helpful. And be careful that if you want it to be one syllable, you have to say E-N, not E-N. If you turn it into E-N, you might as well have kept it even. Um, and again, you can choose to, and a director will often tell you to, and you just have to fit that into one beat. Um, who even in pure and vestal modesty, Still blushes, thinking their own kiss is sin, but Romeo may not beat, he is banished. Okay, so that's, a, that's the same thing. So he repeats it twice, and we have this expansion of verse, demanding to be heard. I don't think I covered it. Banished, 
has an accent on that ed. That's one of our added syllables. The actual term for that is expansion. I don't think it's entirely necessary to know, but it, there's another glossary term if it's helpful. Expansion. That's adding the ed. That's adding the accented i that we discussed last week. I don't think there's an example of that in here. Although arguably the accented eyes happen more often in Shakespeare than the EDs. We just don't hear them as much because people don't use them. Um, flies may do this, but I from this must fly. So something's wrong there, right? Um, now this is, I haven't stopped for them before. There's arguable trochees in here, but this, is, this line is most certainly a trochee. So flies may do this, right? So flies is gonna take the accents. The first word of the line is accented. And often in Shakespeare, people talk about, I don't wanna get overwhelmed with this, people talk about trochaic lines. And what that means is that the entire line is in that verse form, okay? So datum, 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 datum. Shakespeare does do that occasionally. Most of the time, his trochees just start a line and then he returns to an iambic verse, um, which is what he does here. So. Flies may do, uh, fly, uh, actually, well, for the first two, he doesn't. Flies may do this, but I from this must fly. They are free men, but I am banished. That's another ED. And sayst thou yet that exile is not death. So that sayst is actually, in so, you know, that's actually one syllable, and sayst. So if you add that E, it becomes sayest, and that's two syllables. Um, and sayst thou yet that exile is not death. Hadst thou no poison mix, no sharp ground knife, no sudden mean of death, though ne'er so mean, but banish shed to kill me, banish shed. So you can hear the hammer of this verse, right? Demanding, he knows exactly what he wants. And in finding, in getting under this and understanding this, it will help you understand um, the heartbeat, and not just the iambic, but the, the, the heartbeat of, what, of, of Shakespeare's notes. Um, in this next line, friar is actually going to elide to one syllable. Friar, I, I wouldn't say it that way, but that's textually what it is. O friar, the, the, o friar, the damned use that word in hell. So here's a good example, right? Friar is one syllable is awkward, but I'm adding an accent to damned. Now, what if I didn't? It would become, O friar, the damned use that, the, O friar, the damned use that word in hell. It's not quite right. It's not totally wrong. I think you could actually make an argument for that. I think O oh, Friar the Damned used that word in hell is the is the more, more logical. Again, it's interpretive. Um, howlings attend it, that's a trochee. Howlings attend it. How hast thou the heart? Being here elides to one syllable. Being, again, so fit it in. Being a divine, a ghostly confessor. Um, and this is a feminine ending. Okay, I think this is our one feminine ending in the speech. Being a, div being a divine, a ghostly confessor. Or maybe not. Maybe I'm getting this wrong. No, or maybe it's all a trochee. Is it all a trochee? Being a, being a, no, it's not. All right, so let's figure it out. Being a divine, a ghostly, being a divine, a ghostly confessor. So if you don't elide being, if you say two syllables, it becomes a feminine ending. If you elide it, you have a full line. Being a divine, a ghostly confessor. How interesting. All right, I'm not gonna get hung up on it, but that's a good example of a line where you have to parse it. You have to do some work, right? So you could elide being to one syllable. Um, and then the lines ease even, but you're saying confessor. Um, there's a sort of famous example. I'm gonna put some more light on me. Um, there's a sort of famous example of Olivier doing Titus where he said receptacle because the verse said of receptacle, the verse guided him to receptacle. Interpretive. Uh, I think some people will hear it as a bit affected. Um, but often there are parts where affectation is not a bad thing. I don't know, it's again, you can make your choices and sometimes your director will make a choice for you or ask you to make a certain choice. Um, but these are just, again, this is your basic. This is the most basic foundation. A sin absolver and my friend profess to mangle me with that word banished, right? So we have two 12 beat lines and one, maybe one feminine ending, but the entire thing is even. 
right? It's he, Romeo is hammering with the verse. I will say on a personal note, I've done Romeo three times. Um, and this speech was, it's funny teaching it now and talking about how even it is. This speech drove me up the wall. Um, you almost always have to open the second act with it. You have, to, you have to rev yourself up into this emotional state. I found it really difficult. Um, and this is the sort of rhetoric, and this may be a lecture we talk about where this heightened emotion sort of demands uh, a heightened performance in a certain way. And you have to find a very delicate balance between how sort of crazy you're going up there and how much you're showing how emotional you are and how much you're letting the language and the verse do the work for you. Um, so good, there's Romeo. Uh, and now um, we'll go to an incredibly irregular speech in uh, The Winter's Tale. This is act one, see, I'll send you a link. This is act one, scene two, probably more than halfway down. Um, yeah, we're gonna start with inch thick, knee deep, which is, not quite halfway down the page. I'm sharing it in the chat now. And let's go to that. So to come back to it while people get themselves lined up, what we're looking at is the most basic form of scansion here. This is a foundational map that you're drawing for yourself. Um, it'll give you lots of hints and you'll get a good sense of the verse. And really you can do it in a metronome and see where, see where, you, get, see where you get mixed up, see where the hiccups happen. Um, uh, but again, there's a lot more, some of the bigger work we're not looking at tonight. These are just your foundational maps. All right. So here's a speech that is just fucking wild as far as verse goes. You'll see, you're going to, you'll, it'll, you'll be hard pressed to find a crazier verse speech than this. Um, uh, and going over it as a metronome, it's going to sound even worse than Romeo did, um, but it'll give you a sense of... Now, also, Romeo is arguably er, earlier side career, sort of mid-career. Leontes is late career, um, almost as late career as Shakespeare got without writing with collaborators. Um, uh, so right off the top here, let me see if I've skipped anything. No, I don't think I have. Um, great. Um, so right off the top, I'll address monosyllables. Um, often monosyllables or a monosyllabic line, a line where every word is of a single syllable. Shakespeare is offering to you to slow down and emphasize more and maybe emphasize all of it. One of the most famous ones, uh, you know, well, there's many famous ones, but, um, Hamlet's, I do not know why yet I live to say these things to do, is, is one of the more famous monosyllables. So this speech doesn't open with it, but we're starting. Um, but we're starting. We're going to start with, uh, I see a question. Thank you for the question. I will open, I will go to questions at the end for a little bit. Um, uh, so we're looking at inch thick. I think, I hope everybody's found it at this point. Um, and so these are monosyllables, but I'm still gonna do it in the metronome, okay? So be aware that this isn't quite right, but inch thick, knee deep, or head and ears a forked one. So that's a, that's a feminine ending, it's 11 beats. Um, and make sure that or, you can say or, if you can get that little dollop in there for the or, I aesthetically think it sounds nicer. Um, so that's entirely your call. If you make it aware, you're gonna find yourself fucking yourself up. You're gonna start feeling the hiccup, all right? Uh, inch thick, knee deep, aware, head and, ears up, you, it, it goes off, right? So inch thick, knee deep, or head and ears, a forked one. Go play, boy, play, thy mother plays and I. And now here's an interesting thing, right? We have an end of verse line that really seems to point to playing right through. So, uh, Peter Hall famously wrote in his book, Advice to the Players, that he believes every verse line should end with a sense break. So even if there's no punctuation, you should take a slight pause to establish the line. I disagree with this. I wanna put it out there if you wanna look up Peter Hall for his version of things. Uh, it's just called Advice to the Players. There's some good stuff in it. 
but I disagree with the fact that you always must take a sense break at the end of the line. However, I do think it's exciting to explore a sense break at the end of a line. I think it's a good hint to something that you could do. So, um, go play, boy, play, thy mother plays, and I play too. So if you take a sense break, perhaps Leontes is taken up short by not knowing what he's doing and making a decision, right? You can equally go, go play, boy, play, thy mother plays, and I play too, but so disgraced a part who's issue, all right? And so that's a feminine. Um, we also have, we're coming up on something called consonants. That's something for your glossary, if you like. This is where consonant sounds are going to echo themselves. We also are coming on to onomatopoeia, which I don't want to spell for you um, because I can't spell it for you. You can look it up if you'd like. Um, but onomatopoeia is where, um, and it's spelled weird too. It doesn't look like it sounds. Uh, um, it's where a sound imitates. Uh, so we're coming up on a word like hiss. So hiss, thank you, Will Block. Um, hiss evokes the sound. The word hiss evokes the sound it is describing, okay? Um, so, and so this, is, this may be a hint to lean into our sibilant S's a little bit. Play two, but so, and disgraced also gives you one. But so disgraced a part whose issue will hiss me to my grave, contempt and clamor. Another feminine. Again, most of these line endings are feminine. Most of them are going to end with an, with a, with an unstressed syllable. Um, so what does that mean? Um, Patsy Roddenberg, in her book, Speaking Shakespeare, it's an excellent book. I recommend it. Um, I don't, she goes into this sort of circle stuff with characters that I think is a little heady. I, I, don't, I don't love it as much, but she is quite brilliant. She's one of the most famous voice and speech teachers in the world. Um, she has four or five books on voice and speech, all very worth reading. Um, speaking Shakespeare deals, deals directly with Shakespeare and with Shakespearean examples. It's wonderful. Um, she argues that feminine endings um, always address the fact that a character's state of mind is disjointed. Um, uh, Shakespeare's verse reflects the state of mind of his characters. I don't, like any rule, I don't know that this is always true, but I find it really intriguing, especially when multiple feminines start building up on each other, okay? So Romeo, he was emotionally upset, but not intellectually messed up. He knew what he, uh, he knew what he was fighting for, what he was going on about, right? Uh, Leontes is in a wild mess, deeply jealous, in a total rage over it, uh, without real evidence, but creating evidence, uh, and going through multiple perspectives. He's speaking to his son while he speaks to the audience. So it's entirely disjointed. And so these feminine endings can guide you to a character's disjointed state of mind, uh, potentially. Um, uh, but so disgraced apart whose issue will hiss me to my grave. Contempt and clamor will be my, that's again feminine, will be my knell, go play, boy, play. There have been. Now this double, this lineates there have been separately. I don't think there's right, that's right. I think there have been as part of the line preceding it. And um, I think there have contract into one word. So there, and we do that today. Uh, contract, contractions we do all the time today. We also do elisions, just not the same way Shakespeare did. Um, you know, if, if you live in Southern California in some, you know, if somebody says they've probably done something, uh, it's usually probably, I, I probably, I, I probably did that. Um, uh, so we, we have elisions in our speech too. They're just not the same as Shakespeare's. Contractions, however, often are the same. Um, will be my now go play, boy, play, there have been, or I am much deceived, cuckolds ere now. All right, so we have a hiccup. Um, or I am much deceived, cuckolds ere now. Um, and so this, the stress just jumps to the front. I won't get hung up on it, but these are the hiccups you're listening for. Um, and they'll guide you into how you're going to adjust in the verse. Again, we talked last week about maintaining the audience's ear, right? Um, and as Shakespeare does these sharp shifts in the verse, um, that kind of shift on stress forces you to adjust how you're going. And so as you adjust pace, and you can take these as clues. If there's a, an adjustment in stress, there's an adjustment in pace, or there's an adjustment in emphasis. Um, 
And I think it's interesting that cuckolds uh, is the word that sets off Leontes in a slightly different way, or I am much deceived. Cuckolds air now. It's almost that he can't get it out. Like the word itself, that c gets choked in him, or I am much deceived. Cuckolds air now. And many a man, and many a man, right? And many a man there is in at this present. So, so again, here's a good example. And many a man there is in at this present. So that's an 11, actually it's a 12. And many a man there is in at this present. No, it's a feminine ending. Again, I'm not gonna get hung up on it. I think I'm making my point, but it's, it's, a, it's a line that gives you a hiccup and you're gonna work it out. Um, and good, actually, I'm gonna skip forward because we're, this is, this is going on. The only thing I wanted to point out was an, an interesting possibility. Um, uh, oh, they've lineated this differently. How interesting. Have the disease and fear. Oh, that's interesting. So the lineation on the last line here is different. Uh, and feel it not, how now, boy. I've read a lineation where it's sort of a short line, and I thought I might make an interesting caesura point to you, but we're looking at something that's not going to help us, so I'm not going to make it. Um, so that is your metronome foundation on scansion. And what you're doing is you're seeking the irregular. Don't worry about lineating everything. Don't worry about checking each box. If you want to do this sort of foundational work, I do think it's helpful. I hope part of my examples here have shown in ways it might be helpful. Don't, I would encourage you not to take the time to hammer every regular line. It's going to get mind numbing. Um, seek the irregular. The irregular is where Shakespeare is giving you notes. Um, and sometimes the irregular is also us just, is, is also us being brought, attention being brought to the fact that we speak this differently than they did then. And, this, uh, we did talk about this last week. There is a gray area here. Um, I, I, think, I think if you were to declare, I'm going to say everything the way I do, we do nowadays, Romeo's speech, I think, would be pretty awkward to hear banished over and over again. It's not, it, it hiccups wrong. However, per last week's example, if you were to hear Antony uh, say ambition over and over again, I think that would also throw an audience off. It's not, it, it it's awkward enough to our ear that you're going to lose their ear. For a second, they're going to go, what, what was that? So it's a total gray area for you to work on, for a director to work on. Often an artistic director, if you're lucky enough to work at a theater that has a voice and speech department, of which there are far too few these days, all of them, all of these people hopefully will be collaborating with you to create the map of the language. Um, I hope I've given you some of the tools or the beginning of some of the tools, or reinforce some of the tools so that you can, you can do some of this work yourself. Um, I think that's, that's all I wanted to say about that. Um, I, uh, 749. I could take one or two quick questions if there are any. Uh, let's do the hands up thing. And so again, if you open your participants, there's a, there should be a raise hand button. Um, and just click that and I should see you if anybody does have any questions. I'm also very happy to move on if nobody does. Audrey, I'm gonna ask you to un, hold on. Why can't I? All right, Audrey, I'm asking you to unmute. Hello. Hi. 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 Um, so my question was what are the specifics for the accented I. You'll scan it. Um, the, a, a good question. Let's let's go to Anthony's speech real quick. Um, I'll give you uh, if you can navigate yourselves, Bandy. If not, I will give you a link momentarily. Um, where is that forum? Um, oh, I'm looking at Anthony and Cleopatra. That's I'm that's why I'm confused. There we go. Um, so act three, scene two, possibly, beginning with possibly the most famous lines in English rhetoric. The link is now in the chat. Um, 
And it starts with friends, Roman countrymen, lend me your ears. We're actually going to run down a bit um, to... Uh, so are they all, all honorable men, come I to speak in Caesar's funeral. So we'll start with Antony's, he was my friend. That's about a third of the way into the speech. Mm -hmm. All right, he was my friend. So again, I'll metronome this. He was my friend, faithful and just to me, but Brutus says he was ambitious. So the verse is telling you where the line is. Um, if it's scanned to, but you know, but Brutus says that he was ambitious, you would, that again, that doesn't read right, of course, but it is, it is the, the meter that's telling you whether an added accent is there or not. I would say in, this is, a, I'm pulling this out of the air, but in 80% of cases, words that have I-O-N have the accent. Um, okay. but, you, but you have to do the metronome scan. I mean, you don't have to do it. You know, some people can just read it and know. Um, and that's part of the fun stuff. As you get good at this, it's like learning to read music. Um, you'll be able to sit down and cold read this stuff uh, in the same way somebody can sit down and cold read music. Um, you know, I used the jazz metaphor last week. It's, you know, you're learning your chords before you can improvise. But, you know, it, a group of seasoned Shakespeareans sitting down will often cold read a script metric, near, you know, metrically beautifully. Um, uh, so that's, that's where that I-O-N accent comes in. Um, Perfect. And on a side note on it, it's often avoided these days, and I understand why, but I will say that especially characters of affectation, take a Malvolio or a Sir Turio or a Sir Andrew, maybe all the knights, um, uh, adding those ions can be really nice. You can make it a character trait. You can make affectation a character trait. But while Antony is being this rhetorical badass, having this little ion, uh, I think, it's, I think the wise decision is to take it out. Um, all right. Um, any other, any other quick, oh, I had somebody in the chat threw something up. I'll check it. Um, Emily, um, would you say more often than not, when you do your first scan, you try to shorten to one syllable or expand to two syllables based on whether it fits the rhythm? Or would you do the reverse and determine if the, Okay, good question. So do I start by shortening things or do I start um, by taking them as we speak them today? Um, I, I'm gonna actually give you two answers. I generally, sh I've reached a point where I can read things pretty well cold. Um, so I will usually make an informed decision and only stop if, if it doesn't work, if the hiccup comes. Um, I think if you're starting this from a, from a newer point and you're teaching your ear, I would, I would recommend starting from the point of the way we pronounce things today. Um, because you'll hear it, you'll hear the, the hiccup. All right, good, so let's get to work. 